Hi everybody, Steve Scott here, and this video is going to be a brief history of the early years of Kodokan Judo. I find this subject fascinating, and I know a lot of you do too. And uh, there's the, the old Mariner saying, if you don't know where you came from, you don't know where you are, and you certainly won't know where you're going. So uh, history is important. And I think the early years of Kodokan Judo are, are really fascinating. I've always been fascinated by this ever since I was a boy. I started Judo when I was 12, and uh, my first sensei, Jerry Sweat, was a, a Kodokan black belt, spoke Japanese. He was um, a, a real student of Judo and a, a real history of Judo, and he Im imbued that interest in, in the history of Judo into me, and I've never lost it, and I hope you get it too. So we're going to delve into this. Not enough that it deserves, but give you some bullet points of the very early years of Kodokan Judo. And I want to um, credit uh, the, the resource material that I have, which is excellent, and I, I recommend you buy it. So everything I read from here, everything, I, most, I would say 99% of the information you're going to see on this video comes from these sources. And so here they are. The first one is by Don Drager, and of course, you know, if you watch any of my videos, you know I'm a, a big fan of Don Drager. Uh, Modern Bujutsu and Budo, or Bujutsu and Budo, and it's volume three in a series. It's a, a, a classic series. So uh, by Dreger, that's the first uh, uh, first reference material here. Um, also, uh, out of print, unfortunately so, A History of Judo by Sid Hoare, a Brit who was uh, in the 1964 Olympic Games and it was a real true master of, of Judo. He, like Don Dreger, has passed on. Uh, and, and they were just uh, wonderful things uh, in judo and a great historian. This book, if you can find it, it's probably worth a lot of money out on the Internet. Um, I, I think it was just a very limited run, uh, and it was along with his um, Slow Boat to Yokohama, and it was his team, uh, you know, talking about how he trained in Japan and lived in Japan. So Sid Hoare is a very fascinating guy. Anyway, A History of Judo, great book. Another book I highly recommend by Christopher Clark, uh, Saving Japan's Martial Arts. It is a very concise, well-written, well-documented, well-resourced book. Um, I highly recommend this book. It is a really good one, uh, and um, so a great book. I, I really recommend this book. Another one uh, by John Stevens, simply an excellent book, uh, The Way of Judo, A Portrait of Jigoro Kano and His Students. It is a very well-written book by John Stevens and uh, well-researched well documented. Um, again, there it is, A History, uh, The Way of Judo, a portrait of Jigoro Kano and his students. Great book. Uh, another uh, book by Brian Watson is Judo Memoirs of Jigoro Kano. I highly recommend this book as well. Uh, again, well documented, well researched, well written, uh, an interesting read. Uh, so Judo Memoirs of Jigoro Kano, great book. And again, what of my reference material here. Now, uh, if you if you watched any of my videos or you know know much about the way I look at judo, I'm a big fan of Jeff Gleason uh, and his uh, 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 you know way of looking at judo and teaching judo. Uh, there are two books that are the nice. The, let me just intersect here. Uh, add in here the nice thing about Gleason. Uh, it's all his books are t you know heavy and technical stuff and judo principles, concepts of competitive judo primarily, but judo is physical education. But he's also very good at citing a lot of historical data. And uh, Judo Inside Out, uh, uh, one of the great books, in my opinion, of judo by Jeff Gleason. Um, I, I use this also for, in reference for this historical stuff, but a great book anyway. And another book by Gleason, all about judo. Uh, again, it's a technical book, but he, he has a lot of reference to some historical stuff that uh, is, is very important. And, you know, because, you know, and Gleason knew, and, and any good judo coach, any, anybody who's been around knows, who's a real student and exponent and proponent of Kodokan judo, um, knows that historically, uh, judo is the, uh, the trunk of the tree. It's, 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 the, it's the main trunk, and uh, things branched off. You know, Sambo, you know, developed in the Soviet Union, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu developed in Brazil, uh, other forms of grappling that, that came about that uh, you know, not quite didn't catch on worldwide like uh, Sambo or BJJ did, but 
you know, judo, the Kodokan judo is the, is the foundation, is, is really the foundation. And judo came from something. Judo came from feudal koru, or, or you know, that's uh, koru, um, um, feudal ancient jujitsu. Uh, jujitsu was uh, initially developed, uh, called jujitsu. Uh, and uh, well, I'm going to say jujitsu because it's easier for the English speaker to say jujitsu is do jujitsu. You can say that as well. But it, um, uh, in the 1500s, into the well in the 1500s, 1600s, um, the, the the branch of buge or martial martial disciplines in in feudal Japan branched off into this thing called jujitsu, and it it was the first um, martial discipline, fighting discipline, war discipline, to have a name based uh, that that was on its principles. You know, many cases like in, in uh, sword fighting or spear fighting, they were named sword fighting or spear fighting, kinjutsu or, or, or naginata and, you know, the, the different types of things, um, uh, kudo or kujitsu at the time, uh, you know, archery. But jujitsu was the first that uh, to have a name that really um, the, the principles, the concepts of it described what it was about. And there were different forms. There were different schools or ru, R-Y-U, of, uh, and again, pardon my American English, but, you know, I, I know I mispronounce it to some degree, but there were different schools, or ru, uh, of, of jiu-jitsu that specialized in one thing or the other. So there were some that specialized in atemiwaz, or striking techniques. There were some that specialized in more of the ground fighting, you know, uh, shimei, or strangling, or constriction techniques, or kensetsu waza, or joint locking techniques, or nagewaza, throwing techniques. So they all had different you know, aspects or different things that they did mainly that each school did. And there were probably several hundred, at least 200 or so, uh, that developed through from the early 1500s up through the Meiji period in 1868 when Japan was really open to the West. And it was the, uh, the, the new emperor, Meiji, came in. It was called the Meiji Restoration in 1868 and developed a, a new era. So it was taking... So in Japanese history, you have to understand this a little bit before we get into the history of judo. You have to understand that the Japan, when when um, Admiral Perry opened, you know, Japan to the world when he when he entered Tokyo Bay, um, it, it it changed Japan forever. It changed the history of Japan, and certainly their culture uh, started to adapt to the to the Western uh, mores and methods of, of living. So it changed Japan a lot, and. Part of that change was in the martial arts, the 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 buge, the the martial bujitsu training, and eventually what we saw was the rise of what's called budo, or martial or military philosophy. Do means way or philosophy, as opposed to the jitsu or jutsu, which means a art or a skill. So from jujitsu, from 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 client, um, you know, a, a flexible, supple art or skill. It evolved into what we know now as judo, Kodokan judo, thanks to the great work of a man named Jigoro Kano. So let's get right into that. And in on October 28th, 1860, Jigoro Kano was born in Mikage, Japan. Mikage is now part of the greater metropolitan area of Kobe. And he was one of five children, born into a, a fairly well-to-do upper middle class, maybe upper class family. Who uh, was in the sake business? They they were they they, they sold they, they distilled and sold sake, so they made a good living. And and uh, Kano was um, uh, very much um, a, a um, I wouldn't say an aristocrat, but he was a gentleman, a young gentleman. He got the best education, got very good education, and he went on to uh, become a doctorate. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So uh, he was a, a well educated man, and he right from the start uh, he was born for great things. So in 1887, or 1877, pardon me, 1877, Jigoro Kano started training in jiu-jitsu. Now, what, he was a young man who was uh, small, physically small in stature, and he was picked on, he was bullied, and uh, he wanted to learn how to defend himself. And he also heard things about from, from other people he knew in his, uh, you know, his teen years, his teenage years, um, you know, how, how uh, this thing called jiu-jitsu was uh, a way to learn how to fight and when had to learn how to defend yourself and become stronger physically. So he liked that idea. So probably in the mid-1870s or so, he started to try to find, as a teenage boy, 
someone who would teach him jiu-jitsu. In fact, he was discouraged by his father from learning it because uh, at that time, again, we're talking the Meiji Restoration, many things that were of the old feudal Japanese uh, uh, era were now discarded. One of those things was jiu-jitsu. It was kind of looked down upon as somewhat of a, you know, a carnival act or, um, you know, a bit on the shady side by, you know, by respectable Japanese people at the time. And Kano's father kind of discouraged him from doing it. But Kano didn't listen to his dad on this one, and he uh, wanted to keep studying jiu jitsu. And in 1877, he found an instructor. After He looked for quite a period of time for people to accept him, and he finally found an instructor. And again, I go back to all the reference material I have here. I'm, I'm just giving you some quick, not so quick, maybe bullet points you got to flesh it out. you got to read these books. I mean, they are absolutely fabulous. If you want to hear, read more about the character of Jigoro Kano, what kind of a really tenacious kind of type A personality he was to do what he did in life. And it's uh, you, when you read enough about him, you will come to admire the man. You really will. But let's get back to this. So in 1877, his first sensei in jiu-jitsu was uh, Hachinosuke Fukuda. Fukuda was his first sensei. And it was in the Tenshin Shinyoru style of jiu-jitsu. Now, the Tenshin Shinyoru uh, emphasized uh, uh, pressure points, um, um, uh, striking, uh, atemiwaza, the striking techniques, um, and some grappling, some, some good grappling. I think they were very good in shimewaza, the constriction techniques. And um, that's, that, was, that's, that was the approach to it. And so Kano studied with Fukuda uh, for two years. And what happened, uh, uh, Hachinosuke Fukuda died. He was an older gentleman when, when Kano started training with him. And he died, in, uh, Fukuda died in 1879. And so um, upon Fukuda's death, Kano was such an ardent, good student of the, 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 the system of jiu-jitsu, uh, Fukuda's widow uh, bestowed upon uh, Jigoro Kano the, uh, the scroll um, and the, uh, the, uh, the teaching certificate that uh, said he was the successor to Fukuda in his dojo to teach judo, to, to teach this form of jiu-jitsu, I should say. So, um, and he, he tried to do that for a while, but he, but he found that he was still a student in himself. He didn't know enough, and uh, he, he wanted to keep learning. So he sought another instructor, and he, he found one fairly quickly. And so he continued to train, kind of continued to train under uh, Masamoto Iso. Now, Iso... Masamoto Iso was, was the son of, actual son of the Tenshin Shinyoru's founder, uh, who uh, actually started. And Tenshin Shinyoru was a fairly new jiu-jitsu school or system and probably developed in the early, well, probably mid, mid-1800s. So it was fairly new. So, um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the son was the heir to it. And uh, the, this was uh, Masamoto Iso. And, and, Kano continued to train with him, but uh, but Iso died in 1881. So again, his second instructor died. So Kano was still looking for you know another instructor because he knew he wanted to learn more. And so in 1881, Kano was uh, 21 years old. He was still a very young man. So he knew he had to, a lot to learn in life. So he then found uh, an instructor in Kitoru, and Kito Kito means to um, to rise and fall, and uh, uh, that's it's the philosophy. It's almost like yin and yang type thing. And Kitoru, uh, he, well, anyway, Kano started training in Kitoru under Tsunatoshi Iikubo. Iikubo. I'm sorry if I slaughtered that name, but again, American English here. And um, in in 1883, um, you know, after two years of training with uh, Kano, training under him. Iikubo awarded Kano a, a teacher's license in Kitoru Jiu-Jitsu. So um, Kano was a student, a keen and ardent, uh, a, a very earnest student of Jiu-Jitsu and came to a lot of extra practices and was just one of those guys that you'd love to have in your dojo. Well, Kano was that kind of a guy. So, um, and, and after, real quick here, after Kano uh, formed his Kodokan school in 1882, which I'll get to in a moment, he continued to train and continued to have his sensei, Ii Kubo, come in and, and teach classes at the Kodokan. So, you know, he didn't have a bad break or anything with his instructor. He, he had a very good break, and it was, he succeeded. Uh, he was a successor to, the, uh, to his three instructors, and he did them proud. 
So let's get on here. So in 1881, Jigoro Kano graduated from Tokyo University, or what was later to become Tokyo University, and he continued to study for another year or two in graduate work in philosophy and economics. So he was still very much a, a young man, still very much a student, uh, and getting his you know feet under him, and um, all the time learning jiu-jitsu. He was a very busy young man. So in February 1882, uh, after having graduated from Tokyo University, he uh, secured some teaching positions. And in February 1882, he set up a house. Uh, by the time of, he had already moved to Tokyo some time ago uh, from the Kobe area. And he set up a house and a dojo and a school at the Aisho Temple. It's called Aishoji. A G-J-I means temple. So the Aisho Temple was the first Kodokan. You'll hear just in a second more about this. So it was a very small structure. Would they have just nine mats or 12 mats? I can't remember exactly. Very small area, nine tatami or so. And um, it was um, it was not built to be a dojo. You know, it was it was it was, it was a, really a house. And so this was located in Tokyo. And he called this first school that he started in February of 1882, the Kano Juku. And Juku means school, so it's the Kano School. And this, the Kano Juku lasted until um, um, 1891, I believe, uh, early 1800s, I think 1891. And then he closed it down because he was so busy doing many other projects. But what he did, he, he brought um, students uh, to, to study under him in, in various subjects that he taught. And uh, one of them was jujitsu. The, 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 before he really formulated the Kodokan method. So between February of 1882 and on June 5th, 1882, um, he was formulating this in his mind. He was developing this Kodokan system. So on June 5th, 1882, Kano formally established Kodokan Judo. And he started calling what he taught after that Kodokan Judo. And that was fine with his instructors. It was a, a, a good su succession of, of, of skills, and, and he, he passed on the torch from his senseis on. So he developed the, the concepts of Kodokan Judo. And um, at this point, let me just say, Kano, if, if you watch any of my videos, you know I'm a big fan of Jigoro Kano. He was a brilliant man, um, a man, as they say, ahead of his time. But he certainly set the times. He certainly set the tone. He was one of those people who is one of the foundations of many things in history. So um, by the starting of Kodokan Judo, he started the ball rolling on many other things too. And we'll get into that as quickly as I can too here. So let's get on here. So in 1883, um, and I'm going to hit these high points. So in 1883, Jigoro Kano developed what we now know as the Q-Dan system, okay? K-Y-U slash D-A-N. And it was the... Um, he was the first, Kano was the first to use uh, colored belts. Eventually they became colored belts. He was the first to use this type of a ranking system, the Q-Don system, as we know it now. Uh, initially, he just had three Q classes, three, you know, uh, under black belt classes, and then three Don grades, or three black belt classifications. Uh, but early on in, in and it is a very complicated system of, of grading and ranking in jiu-jitsu and in all the bougay, the, all the martial arts. Uh, each each system had its own form of grading, and um, uh, it was called the Minkyo system, and it was a licensing system. And earlier you, I mentioned about Kano became, got his uh, uh, teaching certificate or his licenses from to teach uh, Kitoru and Tenshin Shinyuru. He was he was awarded a license to teach. Well, that was the system of ranking that was used, in, and it was, it was very extensive, very complicated. Uh, there was a kind of a generic pattern that was used, but each system of, of martial fighting, each, each you know, bougay, martial you know, uh, discipline, had its own system of, of ranking. So Kano wanted to kind of structure it a little differently based on some Western thinking and advancement uh, because he was very influenced by Western thought, European and, and American thought. So he started this Q Don system in, in 1883. And the first two of his students to be awarded what we now know as black belts, he, what, what he called Shodan. Uh, Shodan means the initial grade. He had Shodan, Nidan, Sandan. Shodan, initial grade, the first step. 
and Nidan was the second step, Sandan was the highest step in his new ranking at that time. The first two people to be actually awarded what we now know as Shodan was uh, Sunajiro Tomita, Tomita and Shiro Saigo. And Saigo became quite famous. Well, Tomita did too, but Saigo became quite famous as quite a, one of the Kodokan's great fighters. So these were the first two individuals to be awarded Shodan in Kodokan Judo. So by, 19, by, by 1885, Kano had fully fleshed this out to, well, not fully, but fleshed it out to his satisfaction for a while that there would be three Q or, or, or Q classes and, and three Don classes. Q and Don virtually mean the same thing. They mean step, step or grade. But often we say a Q now is a, is a degree or a class, like a EQ would be first class or first degree. And, uh, or you could say a showdown would be first degree or first grade. So it, it, they initially mean the same thing, but he, he de designated him Q or Don. So there you go. He started that, and he did that really uh, not to laud you know, his students with, with honors or whatever. He wanted to have some classification because, again, remember, this guy was a school teacher. I mean, this, he was an educator. He taught school. And you advance from one grade to the next in school in a logical progression of skill learning. Well, he wanted to provide this in Kodokan Judo. So that's why he developed the Kyudan system, <clears throat> and now it's expanded to what we have today in just about every martial art. But remember, Kano, <clears throat> Jigoro Kano was the first to develop a ranking system, a belt ranking system in Judo, and it's now used by just about every martial art on the planet. So there you go with a little information there. So um, in 1886, um, the Don grades started wearing a black sash or obi, a belt around the uh, around the, the gi. More on the judo gi a little bit later. Uh, it was still um, they, they were still rough and and rather short in the arms, short in the legs. They almost looked like well they were shorts that they wore on their their legs, and the the jackets were, were rather rough. They usually stopped at the elbow, and there was just basically just a sash, an obi belt to tie around the waist to keep the jacket together. And so in 1886, about 1886 I believe. Um, the, at the Kodokan, they started wearing the black obi. And it became, it became quite the fashion because uh, with the, the, the white judo gi and the black belt, that looked sharp. And it still looks sharp, I think. I mean, a nice, clean white judo gi and a black belt still looks really sharp. Well, it caught on to be quite the thing. So that was a good invention by Kano because that impelled his students to learn more judo and to earn their black belts, their, their shodan, their, their, their initial grade. So a little bit of a marketing tool on Kano's part, but certainly a brilliant one. So in 1893, here's a bit of interesting, the first non-Japanese to enroll at the Kodokan was a captain. We don't know if he was a, he was a military captain. We don't know if he was Navy or Army or what, but Captain H. M. Hughes of England was the first non-Japanese to enroll at the Kodokan. And uh, the first two um, U.S. citizens, uh, Americans, uh, from the United States, in 1899 were uh, John Perkins and John Farley. And I find this interesting because right from the start, Kano had visions of an international movement in, in Kodokan Judo. It just wasn't for Japanese. It was for anyone, for everyone. And that's one of the beauties of Kodokan Judo. It is for everyone. Kano was really big on that right from the start. So let's continue on with some bullet points here. From 1884 to 1886, uh, Kano developed the nagi no kata, the form of the form of throwing, nagi no kata, form of throwing, um, to add structure because uh, to the Kodokan training. At, at the Kodokan, uh, he was heavily influenced by the Kito system, the Kitoru system, where they did a lot of randori, and um, and, and it was very popular for young men. They kind of was a young man himself at the time, and they liked to go at it just like every young man did and does and st still today. Uh, so, but he was finding that he was, his students were, were quite good. They were quite rough, tough guys, as it were, uh, but he wasn't, he wasn't exactly happy with their skill development. So early on, he taught 
uh, some Tenshin Shinyaru and some Kitaru Kata, or, or structured, you know, forms, technique as, as a Kata, as a form, uh, structured training. But that that didn't quite do the trick because their their principles were now beginning to be quite different from the Kodokan principles that, that we that are laid out, as we know, in Kodokan Judo. So Kano wanted to find his own Kata or his own structured training to develop his students. So he just started to develop his own kata, and which is a brilliant idea because what, what is kata? Structured training. Whether we do the formal nagi no kata, the katami no kata, the juno kata that we have in judo, or we look at kata as, as, as I do as well, as many other people do, kata is structured training. It's your drill training. You have to have some structure to your training. Well, kata was an educator. He was a teacher. He knew he just couldn't let the guys show up and beat the heck out of each other for two hours. They had to have some structure to their training. So he developed these kata is how he did that. So brilliant move, and we still have these kata today. And by 1887, uh, Kano developed his second kata, the katami no kata, or the forms of grappling, the forms of groundwork. Uh, katami means to hold in place or to, um, um, in, in, in the concept of controlling and holding something. So a form of controlling, form of holding. Uh, mainly Nawaza ground fighting techniques, and in and, and all, all the structures, all, all the techniques, uh, not just pins, but uh, you know, but but uh, also uh, arm locks and even a leg lock, and some strangles were in there. So the katami no kata was something to help round out his students, and the nagi no kata and the katami no kata are still called to this day the randori no kata, or the, the forms of randori, or forms of free practice, because these are the techniques that we can use safely in randori. And the other kata we don't use in randori. So the nagi no kata, katami no kata, called now the randori no kata. And they developed that phrase somewhere in the 1890s or so. But anyway, uh, like I said before, Kano initially taught uh, the Tenshin Shinryo, Shinryoru and Kitoru kata in their original form, but since they were constructed according to different systems, which was the, those systems of jiu-jitsu, and now Kano was beginning to uh, change considerably, uh, he wanted to create these new kata uh, to reflect the principles of Kodokan Judo so they'd better you know, reflect what he was actually wanting his students to learn, the principles of Kodokan Judo. And in 1891, uh, on a personal note, Kano married uh, Sumako uh, Take, Takazoe, Takazoe, and I believe she was a um, well-connected young lady. Uh, I think her father was uh, an ambassador to Korea, I believe it was. So she was well, well-connected, and it was a, you know, one of those families that was great. And the couple eventually had eight children. So, uh, you know, the, the Kano, Jigoro Kano started his family life in 1891. And in 1895, Kano received his doctorate. And now he was ready to move on professionally in his education, uh, in, in, in his work of, as an educator. Uh, and he was quite influential in, in um, developing um, curricula for different colleges and universities in, in philosophy, economics. He was a brilliant man. He spoke both English and German fluently. He, he might have spoken some other European languages. He wrote a lot of his personal notes in English and in German, but mainly English, which was rather different for that time. And uh, he, he became quite a uh, quite an admirer of, of the English language as well as German language. So he, a little bit of side note about Kano about that. Jumping back a little bit, in 1884, um, the Kodokan, uh, through Kano's insistence and development, the, the, the Kodokan Judo started to develop what they call the Kohaku Shiai, which they still hold to this day, which is the red and white tournaments, and they're monthly red and white tournaments, I believe, uh, I don't know if they're monthly, but I know the Tsukinami Shiai, the, uh, they are the monthly uh, contests. Um, they, they started these, these, these forms of contest for the students so they could have a competitive outlet, uh, a structured competitive outlet, and um, a, uh, a way to advance in grade. And, and, and often, uh, you know, there, there was a system, and they still do it, of, of um, you know, the, the Kohaku Shiai. If you can, can continue to win these, these tournaments, you'll, you'll advance in, in grade in the Kodokan. They still do that to this day. So that was started in 1884. And, uh, hey, here's a little side note. Initially, we, we call a, a judo competition a Shiai now. Shiai means to test, to meet together to test. Well, initially, using the phrase, phraseology from... Uh, jiu-jitsu, uh, Kano called it a shobu, 
Shobu means a fight. It means a contest, but it means means a fight. And um, uh, it could be a fight to the death, could, any type of a fight, a Shobu. So initially they, they were called Shobu, uh, like they were uh, the, the, the monthly Shobu instead of the monthly Shi'ai. But uh, in 1885... Uh, kind of rethought that concept and started calling contests Shi'ai because he wanted them to be, reflect where they, was, they, were, they were meant to be a meeting, a testing of your own skill against others. It wasn't just a fight. It was a test for yourself. So a bit of it, that, that tells you where Kano wanted Judo to go right from the start as he developed these. Again, early years in 1885, Kano was a 25-year-old young man. He was still learning as he went along. He was still fleshing these things out. So, um, um, again, this is one of the advances in Kodokan Judo, calling it instead of Shobu, a Shi'ai. Now, in 1895, uh, Kano uh, formed a, a committee of his top people and, and through, of course, his own work. Um, the first Gokyo no Waza, the first, uh, there were five classifications of throwing techniques uh, that were developed, and they were, um, um, yeah, I think they were, you know, look at 42 initially. It, in 1920, it was pared down to 40, and it stayed that way up in for, for quite a few years till it was it was revamped in the in the 1980s. Uh, but um, the initial Kodokan Gokyo Nawaza was really a, a framework, a structure for how to teach judo. And again, Kano uh, admittedly. Uh, liked throwing techniques. He preferred nagewaza, throwing techniques, over katamewaza, or grappling techniques. He did that. It was his own preference. And uh, to me, just a personal note, uh, a weakness, I believe, there was never a classification, uh, goku, no, goku no waza type thing done for the ground fighting, um, you know, to, to include as many of the techniques they did as, as they did in throwing, they would include in ground fighting. They didn't do that. And I think that's one of the weaknesses of, of, of the early years. And again, that was Kano's preference for the Nagewaza over the, the ground fighting of Katamewaza. But things got better as, as went along. And I might add, um, uh, one of the knocks that a lot of people like to say about the early years of Kodokan Judo, a lot of uh, uh, people who want to kind of uh, say their own history, to maybe um, propel their own whatever form of grappling or fighting they have where um, uh, Kano's guys lost to a lot of the ground fighters. Well, early on, uh, in those, those early days of contests, of um, competitions, um, there, were, there was no set standard rule set. You know, it wasn't until 1899, and we'll get to that in a moment here, that, that there was a, a standardized set of rules written. So the first 17, 18 years of judo... Um, you basically, um, whatever, the, if, if like the uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department, they set their rules. These are the rules. They said, well, these are the rules for this contest. That's what you guys will fight under. So if you wanted to enter, you know those rules were set for that contest. Or if I wanted to have, uh, say I was from the Kodokan, and I wanted to have a match with another school, another jiu-jitsu school, we could negotiate the rules and set up the rules that were, you know, hopefully as advantageous to me as I possibly could, but they would have their side too. So we would negotiate on what the rules were. So the early years of Kodokan Judo kind of wanted to prove himself. He was a young instructor, a young coach, who wanted to let his system be known uh, for, for, for the quality it was. And he did have very good technicians. He had a very good technique. Um, technically, he was light years ahead of a lot of the many jiu-jitsu people. So he basically entered his guys in as many different competitions as he could with the team competitions or these big, like the Metropolitan Tokyo uh, Police Department, those type of things, um, and they competed a lot. They usually won, but it, sometimes they didn't. And, and some famous cases in uh, the, around 1900 or so, early, you know, 1899, 1900, 1903, those years there, uh, there was a, a style of jiu-jitsu called fusenru, fusen, F-U-S-E-N, fusenru, and they were primarily a ground game. They, they, they did throws, but they were also really good in newaza, ground fighting techniques. And uh, Kano's guys, the Kodokan guys, lost in two duels with those, uh, the, that system. But again, this is the strength of Kodokan judo, started by Kano himself. He said, we got beat. Why? We're, they did something. We're, we're, 
we, we have deficiency in. We've got to make up that deficiency. So what did he do? He had their, their instructors. He invited their instructors, and they graciously did. Uh, they'd come in, and they their, their Fusen Ru and also other systems, the Jikishin Ru and other systems like that, um, they would come in and train the Kodokan people, or, or Kano would send his Kodokan people to go train in their dojos to learn from them. So he was absorbing all these things. So he learned from those losses. There were few. His guys were generally better athletic, they were better in their skill. They were better athletes in many cases, but they did lose contests. There's no doubt about it. I mean, nobody goes undefeated no matter what you do. So, but he learned from it. And judo, to, to this day, one of its great strengths is to absorb things and to bring things into judo. And so these skills of the Fusenru and the other systems of, of jiu-jitsu where he was deficient in, in newaza or ground fighting, um, and that, you know, fighting katamewaza, he said, we've got to build that up. And so he did. They, 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 they got better if, by having these other instructors come in. So that's, that's a great thing about Kodokan judo. So people who like to knock it say, well, they got beat by the ground fighters and they, they proved that that's not very good. Well, the Kodokan absorbed all this. And by, by being this, having this open attitude, Kodokan Judo was by far and away, but by far and away, the most um, uh, advanced and the most popular and the most technically skilled um, form of jujitsu, as it were, still in those days. And it really set the mark. And honestly, if it had not been for Kodokan Judo and Jigoro Kano himself, uh, jujitsu, we probably would be having this conversation because it would have been lost to history. It was it was it was dying in to, with with feudal Japan, and Kano brought it, and kept it. Also, the other jujitsu systems that were were, you know, active at the time, were you know really beholden in many ways to Kodokan Judo because his popularity of Judo uh, it, it kept people coming in the door for them too. So it was a win-win situation for everybody. So that's why. I'm a big fan of Jigoro Kano, so you can see. So anyway, a little aside there. So again, as I just said, the first uh, established contest, the formal contest rules were established in 1899. And Kano was the head of a committee with the All Japan uh, uh, Bugei Society, or Budo Society, uh, which is a whole different video. It was a, a, an amazing society, and it was established by the government to regulate the martial disciplines of Japan at that time. And Kano was very influential in it, and the Kodokan Judo was very influential in it. So he was very big in the writing the first established contest rules in 1899. Through the years, we've had a number of different contest rules in Kodokan Judo, the see where you have now in the IGF rules, what we have in our freestyle and AAU Judo competitions. Other uh, groups have their different contest rules. Judo is Judo. And, and the idea of the establish of a, any, any contest rules, you want those rules to reflect what you want to see done on the mat. So Kano established the rules that were advantageous to what he was teaching in Kodokan Judo, make no bones about it. And uh, he, um, he developed the, 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 this concept of, of forming um, physical education through contest rules. We still do it today. You know, you, you know, we say coach by the rules, you know, so um, kind of kind of developed this. So he, he was he was foremost in this. OK, let's move on to the 1900s now. We may hit back a little bit to the 1800s, but we're, we're going into a new century now. In uh, 1906, Jigoro Kano himself redesigned the judo gi, the, the uniform as we wear it, the jacket. He made the, the sleeves longer. They would cover the elbows. I mean, people were getting scraped up badly on those rough tatami that they were using. He made the, the pants longer. He, he made the belt where it tied as we know it now, where it was a long belt. And as we know, the, the type of belt, the sturdy structured belt that we have now. So Kano design, he designed the lapels so they could strangle and grip better. Um, he designed a, a, a practice uniform that was utilitarian and pragmatic. And it reflected what he was doing in Kodokan Judo. So this the, the Judo Gi we wear now, uh, and they were all white. Everybody wore a white Judo Gi up until, what, 18, 1980 or so when the IJF changed it and started permitting blue Judo Gis. And then we have different colored Judo Gis now of all, all types. But um, they were all white. 
So that's a bit of the history on the uh, judo gi itself. And in 1908, judo, along with kendo, the, the, the fencing art or the fencing, fencing way, the, ken, ken means sword, so the, the philosophy of the sword. Um, so judo and kendo were added to the Japanese uh, as educational system. And by 1911, um, it was, judo was firmly established, along with kendo, but judo was firmly established in the Japanese school system as part of their curriculum. So, uh, again, Kano being an educator, knew the future of his, his you know, entity, his invention, Kodokan Judo, was in education, was in education. And it was about this time also, I think it might have been earlier, I, I don't remember quite off, I have to go to the notes, but he formed what he, the, the, the three culture principle of Judo, Kodokan Judo. Uh, Rentai Ho, which is phys, Judo as physical education, uh, 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 Shushin Ho, uh, Judo as a cultural enhancement, moral development, uh, character development, and uh, 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 Shobu Ho, uh, Judo as a, for, for contest or self-defense. So the three prints, and we still, those are the three principles guiding judo today, and he, he formed about this time. So in 1908, it became into the schools. Now it was firmly established into the Japanese culture. A big, a big huge move, a huge move. 1909, Kano was invited uh, to join the International Olympic Committee, actually by uh, de, uh, uh, Pierre de Corbetin, Corbetin himself, the founder of the Olympic Committee, the founder of the Olympics, and they were friends. They were, they were good friends. And uh, so Pre uh, Jiro Kano was invited by the Olo International Olympic Committee to become the first Asian member. And in July 1911, Jiro Kano, uh, with, with good Japanese support, he, 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 you know, he went, worked for this Japanese government support. And in July of 1911, uh, he organized the J Japanese, the Japan Amateur Ath Athletic Association, and was named as its first president. So you see in 1908, and then again in 1911, 1908, Kano basically became the father of Japanese physical education. That was the first real physical, they had jujitsu in some schools, but that was the first physical education in Japanese schools in 1908. And in 1911, Kano was now the man who was the first to get J Japan into the Olympics. It was his work that got Japan into the Olympics, into the rest of the world. And again, judo was an international event, an, an international activity. Kano, right from the start, wanted this to happen. And he lobbied hard for this. And in 1912, uh, Jigoro Kano was, uh, attended the Stockholm Olympics, as the head of the dele delegation for Japan. And Japan had, I believe, two or three athletes. They had two athletes, I think, yeah, two athletes. Uh, one was entered in track as a runner, and the other one was a marathon runner. There might have been a third. I just don't know well, hand. I, my notes tell me just two. I th th think maybe two or three. But anyway, Kano was in the opening ceremony. He was involved heavily in the Olympic movement from 1911 on. And ha he, he lobbied hard to get Tokyo uh, as the site for the 1940 Olympics, but the Pacific War and, uh, and developed what became World War II, worldwide horrible war, um, and that, of course, that stopped the Olympics in both 1940 and 1944, and uh, it wasn't until 1964 that Kano's dream of Tokyo having the Olympic Games um, happened and, uh, and having judo in the, in, the, in the judo was scheduled to be one of the events in the 1940 Olympic Games. Well, uh, the horrible war at that time came along and that ruined everything for a lot of people um, and in many other ways far worse than, than the Olympics. Uh, you know, was, World War II was a horrible thing, as we all know. So anyway, that set, set that back. But Kano was involved and in, heavily involved in getting judo into the worldwide body of sport. So let's move on with uh, his work. Uh, let's jump back a little bit to uh, 1908. And uh, again, the Italian, or the, uh, I should say the international look to this, because Kano wanted people from all over the world to do judo. And in 1908, <clears throat> the first non-Japanese to be awarded a black belt 
uh, was an Italian uh, man named Carlo Oletti. And, and Carlo Oletti went on to be, I think he might be, I think he is considered the father of Italian judo. Uh, he went on to be uh, quite, quite well, well respected in, in, in Italy for bringing judo to Italy. So 1908 it was the first Don Japanese. And then 1911, uh, E.J. Harrison, and I'm a, I've got a number of Harrison's books. Uh, he was from the U.K., and he received his showdown in 1911. And E.J. Harrison was instrumental in bringing judo to Europe. And judo caught on in Europe in a huge way. And uh, Harrison was one of those early innovators, those early pioneers of, of judo in Europe. So uh, much credit goes to him. And he got his showdown in 1911 from the Kodokan. So he's one of those early men. Also, uh, being an old sambo, sambo guy myself, loving the sambo, um, in 1913, the man, Vasily Oshpeshkov, who was from Russia, um, he was awarded a showdown, his first grade black belt, his initial don grade. And he was the first uh, Russian uh, to, to get a black belt. He, and that was in 1913, and he, he later earned his Nidon, or second Don, in 1917. Now, he went on to become an early founder of what we now know as Sambo. So um, this, this shows you how, like I said earlier, the Kodokan Judo is the trunk of the tree. Well, here we see now the early start of Shpeshkov of the, the Judo roots, and he went on to, to do other things. He studied, and others did too, uh, he, they rounded out uh, what became Sambo. They studied different wrestling methods, different fighting methods from different regions in what became the Soviet Union, the different republics. And so they added to what the Kodokan Judo started. But again, Judo was the genesis of Sambo. I, I openly admit that. It's just the way it is. It's historically accurate. So jumping back just a little bit, in 1904, let's talk about women in Judo. The first woman enrolled at the Kodokan was a woman named Miss Yasuda, and uh, she was in 1904, and she was the first woman enrolled at the Kodokan. Now, the Kodokan didn't have formal, a formal organized women's program until 1923, specifically just for women. But, um, and, and so, again, those early years were pretty rough and ready, so you had to be a tough young lady um, to be training with all those tough young men back in the early days of the Kodokan. So much credit to Miss Yasuda. Uh, it was never recorded that she got her showdown or any, any black belt grade, but she was the, she was the innovator there. Now, the, the first woman to get a black belt, to get her in showdown, was a woman in 1933 named Kosaki Kawako. And again, if I say the names wrong, I apologize for my American English. But in 1933, the first woman to become a black belt in judo was uh, Kosaki Kawako. Now, again, the international flavor here. The first that I've been able to find through research, through all these wonderful authors, and, and uh, what I've tried to glean on the Internet, there might be something out there I don't know. But from what I have found... Uh, the first judo club outside of Japan is really not known, you know, because some came, like, I, I know in, in, the, 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 in Hawaii, there were a number of Japanese immigrants who started various uh, dojos there, but they didn't stick around, and they, you know, and they, they might have been um, successful for a while, and they didn't stay. But um, the, the, uh, the earliest surviving, to, to we know the still surviving judo club that is still in existence was the Seattle Judo Club, started here in the United States, and it was founded in Seattle, in Seattle Washington, in 1903. And I believe uh, Jigoro Kano visited there many years later uh, before his, his death. So we know in 1903, the first strongly established judo club was in, in the Seattle area, and of course down in the Nanka or Southern California area, uh, there was a strong uh, Japanese community there uh, and, and organized clubs, and also in Hawaii in the United States. Now, the first university club that I know of, the first club, they're, they're, again, the Europeans were watching this. I, I didn't research this real well. I do apologize for that. But I do know the first university judo club to, to, that I have been able to find outside of Japan was at Cambridge University. They called the Cambridge University Jiu-Jitsu Club. And they, they were, eventually became a judo club, and that was in the United, United Kingdom in 1906. So 
you see this internationalization of judo right from the get-go, how it started uh, by Kano's design. So those are the really early years of Kodokan judo. Um, I find them fascinating. Um, they were uh, they're a reflection of the man who started the movement, Jigoro Kano. Um, he was a brilliant man, and uh, he's one to be admired in many, in many ways. He was he was very influential in Japanese society. He became a member of their uh, House of Peers, um, and he was a, a, a very very strong advocate of, as I said earlier, physical education. He was the father of physical education in Japan. So not just judo, and he was influential in many aspects of Japanese culture and society. And Kano died, Jigoro Kano died on, uh, on a ship at sea, the uh, uh, Hikawa Maru, Hikawa Maru, the, uh, the, the ship he was tra traveling in on May 4th, 1938. He had successfully lobbied in 1936, and I think they firmed the deal in 1938 to definitely have the Olympics in 1940 in Tokyo. And that's what he wanted his dream to be. That was a dream of his. He didn't live to see that. Of course, had he lived to see 1940, he would have been shattered because the, the horrible World War II came along and uh, he wouldn't have seen Tokyo Olympics at all. But he would be proud of what he did. So that hit, the early history of Kodokan Judo is fascinating. And again, as I said at the top of this very long video, and I do apologize for the length, I tried to keep it as short as I could. But uh, if we don't know where we came from, you know, we don't know where we are and we sure don't know where we're going. And we have to have an honest assessment of what came before us. And I think it's important to have an accurate history of anything we do and certainly this wonderful thing we call Kodokan Judo.